Hi, and welcome to the PO podcast. This is episode four. Um, I'm delighted to be joined today by Dr. Nikki Edison, who is the Orthotics Service Manager and Clinical Lead at the Royal Wolverhampton NHS Trust and a Senior Research Fellow at Staffordshire University. Uh, we're going to be talking today about AFO tuning. Uh, hi, Nikki, thanks for joining us. Hi, Matt, thanks for inviting me. So, um, let's just dive straight in. Um, what is meant by AFO tuning? Is it the same as uh, biomechanical optimization? No. Um, biomechanical optimization and tuning seem to be interchangeable terms at the moment, but they're not the same. Um, Elaine Owen has, has tried to define them and, and the definition she uses is the ones that, that I use and that I put in my, my research. Um, and I think that's where possibly some misunderstanding comes. So biomechanical optimization is the whole process of assessing, designing, um, adjusting and aligning the AFO FC, so the ankle foot orthosis footwear combination. Um, whereas tuning is the fine adjustments to the AFO FC um, to optimise performance um, by altering the SVA, the shank vertical angle, and the heel sole um, differentiation. I think what you've got to understand is the tuning is is it's an important bit, but it's it's making everything else work better. If you don't get the biomechanical optimization issue right, then you can't get the tuning right. Okay. So they're, they're important terms, they're interrelated, but they're different. And so biomechanical optimization that that includes other other prescription choices about NAFO, things like materials and, and trim lines, things like that too. Yeah, it would involve assessing the patient, making sure that you're accommodating the length of gastroc, so um, the AAAFO, uh, the ankle of the angle in the AFO is correct. Um, it would be making sure that you choose the the right material, um, the right material thickness, the right trim lines, um, the whether you would decide to make the foot length, for, uh, the foot plate, for example, flexible, um, mm -hmm. at the third rocker or you'd want to block the third rocker uh, by extending the medial lateral flanges and um, so it's all those things is going to be part of your biomechanical optimization and okay. then the tuning is the fine adjustments after that great um while we're talking about different AFOs then when we're talking about the design of AFOs are there some AFOs that can be tuned and some that cannot be tuned no because if you think of tuning, you've got to think about you have something and you want to optimise it. So you can potentially do that for anything. Now, there is a misconception that, um, for example, flexible AFOs can't be tuned. And yes, that is correct. And no, it isn't, depending which way you look at it. So, for example, if, if you have a patient who is... Um, is not adequate for a flexible AFO, whether that's a hinged AFO or if it's a PLS, whatever it is, uh, you've got movement of the shank. It's not a, a solid AFO. Now, if you've got somebody who, who shouldn't be in that, then you're not ever going to be able to optimise it So because they shouldn't be in it. So you, you, you can't tune it to make it better because the biomechanical optimization is wrong. It's the wrong sure. description for the patient. But if you was to have somebody who had a hinged AFO, um, and maybe they were the activity that we're giving them for their, their goal of their treatment is, is for instance, sit to stand. Um, then we can tune that. We can we can change and block where that movement happens. So what we're doing is optimizing it for that patient for their goals. But if you was to say, can I give a patient? Um, a flexible AFO because they don't like solid AFOs and we'll get onto the terminology in a minute because mm -hmm. that's a, kind of another bugbear. Um, if we, I was to give that them and then be able to tune it to make it better then no, no we couldn't do that. So included in this kind of umbrella term of, of um, biomechanical optimization is also as you said the assessment and, and the purpose of the AFO that also comes under that kind of umbrella as well. Yeah, so okay. you have to choose the right prescription for you, the physical presentation of the patient. Okay, 
How important then is the tuning aspect of that? What, what sort of difference can it make? It makes a big difference. Um, if you if you think of the tuning, so if we're thinking of mid stance, so temporal mid stance, yeah, thirty percent of the gait cycle um, in terms of of, of Gibson's uh, definition. Mm -hmm. If we're looking at that in normal gait, we we're, we're looking at the shank to be inclined between ten and twelve degrees. Now, if we give a a solid AFL, and we're going to assume that everything else is right. The biomechanical optimization has all been done, it's all correct. We've given a solid AFO, it's set at 90 degrees, and that's the correct AFO, but we don't tune it, what will happen? Well, a couple of things will happen depending on the presentation of the patient. We won't get that 10 to 12 degrees of inclination of the shank at mid stance. And what that means is, is if the shank is vertical, then there is nowhere for the thigh to incline to push the the body forward to propel it forward. So sure. what has so what has to happen is the knee has to extend further to allow inclination of the shank. Um, so particularly in patients with a winter's type two gait where knee hyperextension is the predominant um, presentation, we can actually cause further hyperextension of the knee so yes it, it, it's important so as well as the benefits of correctly tuning an afo perhaps sometimes by not correctly tuning an afo or perhaps not tuning at all um where it's where it's necessary there is kind of the potential there to uh cause harm almost and, and to, to cause progression of symptoms rather than uh, alleviation yeah i think uh, i think uh, Roy Bowers has alluded to that in uh, the work he's done uh, and the um, the statement that the, the Scottish board brought out, I think it was 2010, uh, they mentioned um, that it can it can cause um, harm. I think Elaine Owen has said this in a couple of her papers as well. Uh, and if you look at, at my paper, my recent paper, uh, kinematics paper, the case series that came out in 2020, um, you can see particularly in case study one, that was um, a patient hemiplegic uh, CP, uh, winter's type two gait, presenting with hyperextension of the knee uh, at mid stance. And you can see that in the non-tuned AFO, the hyperextension actually increased. Now, it's not something we might have picked up on in clinic. Um, it's very difficult to um, observe gait with the, with the eye alone and pick up on small changes. Sometimes we can see it, but they're usually big changes. Um, but when we put the, the patient through the gait lab, you'll see from the graphs in that paper that the hyperextension increased. Now, had we given her that, she'd come to us to improve her gait, mm -hmm. to um, improve the knee hyperextension. And by giving her non-tuned AFL, we actually increased it. OK, well, that's really interesting because I think people tend to think about uh, tuning as as improving things. But, you know, the, the idea of not tuning, having the potential to make things worse is, is certainly something I think that would uh, be important for people to think of, too. Yeah. If we think about the positives then of tuning, um, what sorts of benefits are there for our patients? Um, I mean, we talk about improved gates, um, I, I guess, things like reduction in, in energy expenditure. Yeah. So if you have a look at the paper, you'll mm -hmm. see that uh, a, quite a, an interesting thing happened because when when we did that study, one of the things that we made sure was the same for both conditions, non-tuned and tuned. The, the AAFO was correct. We didn't want to cause any pressure sores. Mm -hmm. um, so the biomechanical optimization was all correct. It was only the tuning that we were that we were looking at to see the difference. Now we thought about it and we thought how, how can we how can we best do this? And um, we want you to give it ecological validity. So I wanted the patients to walk as they would normally walk. The problem with that when you allow patients to walk at their self-selected speed is that you can't keep those the same then in the two conditions. The other option would be in a treadmill but that would have changed their gait. It wouldn't have had that ecological validity, so we decided against it. But the interesting thing was when we um, when we tuned the AFO, 
um, FC. Their speed and their distance increased. Now, with that, you would expect an increase in energy expenditure. And we actually found that the energy expenditure quite often actually decreased. So we had an increase in, in speed, an increase in distance covered, and a decrease in energy expenditure in the tuned um, AFO condition. So it would have been very interesting to see what would have happened if we would have kept that speed the same and that distance the same. We, we would then had it would have had an even better idea of how much any energy expenditure they would have saved. Um, but still, I, I wasn't expecting that. I was expecting possibly an increase in distance and an increase in speed, but not alongside a decrease in energy expenditure. So it, it just shows the effects. And of course, if you extrapolate that, you know, we did, you know, four minute trials of walking. But if you extra, extrapolate that over a day, a week, you know, or a patient's activity, that that is, a, you know, a lot of energy that you, the patient will be saving, which allows them to, you know, partake in activities of daily living that maybe they, they wouldn't have been able to before. Sure, yeah, that, that's potentially a huge difference to, to people's lives, isn't it? And that's obviously yeah. what we're, we're all aiming for, um, ultimately. Yeah, definitely. Great. Um, I also know from, from reading some of, of, uh, some of your papers and, and other literature as well, things like um, perhaps a reduction in, in falls has been something that's been uh, potentially sort of brought up before and, and increased stability with, with the tuning as well. Yeah, um, I think with the, with the tuning, it can be the difference of a, a patient getting initial contact at the heel or getting initial contact at, at the forefoot. And mm -hmm. of course, the more of the foot that we've we've got in contact with the floor, the more stability uh, the patient has. So it's not something that we looked at in, in our studies, but it'd be certainly something interesting to look at in the future. Okay. Are there certain circumstances where tuning in AFO uh, is likely to make more of a difference than in, in other cases? Are there particular groups of patients? Um, are there certain uh, contraindications to tuning? Um, yes, if you look at the, the work we've done we've and the work that Jagadam has done, um, we found that the Winters Type 2 got the most positive results. But um, there's a caveat to that because when we say the most positive results we've got to look at uh, the whole picture we could clearly see with the the winters type 2 that there was a reduction in knee hyperextension so we know as butler has said before um, and elena Owen has said that with people with particularly children with uh, flexion contractures of the knee and the hip they don't respond well to tuning but Butler looked at the knee only and she didn't look at the hip and the pelvis. So she wouldn't have known what the effects were happening there. We did look at the pelvis and the knee, uh, the pelvis and the hip, as well as the knee. Now, our results confirmed what, what Butler was saying in that the knee didn't respond well to the, the tuning, but actually the hip and the pelvis did. And we saw improvements in hip and pelvic kinematics in the patients that that we studied and um, something that Butler wouldn't have known in the study they did because they concentrate concentrated on the knee. So I think that that agrees with what Owen has said in her papers that although you can have patients with quite severe contractures, um, if you're just looking at the knee, maybe you're thinking there's, there's, there's not much can be done but actually there are positives still to tuning um, and one of those is, is what's happening at the hip and, and the pelvis and nobody's done any work on what's happening uh, in the trunk and the upper limbs. Now when we did our study um, we actually we actually collected that data uh, and it's something we're, we're analysing at the moment and it'll be interesting to see the effects of, of what's happening on the spine and the upper limbs um, because we don't know. Uh, it's just been focused on the knee in the sagittal plane. Um, so yes, there are some patients that respond better um, to tuning when, when we're just looking at the kinematics of the knee, but I think we need a, a more research to see what's happening at the, the hip and the pelvis, and we need research on the, on the spine and, and the upper limb as well, to see what, what positive outcomes these patients are getting that we don't know of yet. 
Absolutely, and, and I, I guess we're, we're talking about improving gait and stability, and, and those things aren't just the, the lower limb, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of full body movement. So that, that would be really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Something that you mentioned earlier, um, so you, you were talking about the AFO FC, the, the, the AFO foot complex. Um, that's something that I wanted to ask you about. So quite often, um, my experience of, of, of being in um, in an orthotics clinic is, is some people tune, some people don't. That's something we can, we can talk about in a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, but when people tune, you're, you're usually tuning in a particular set of shoes, in, in particular footwear. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, not, not, not all heel sole differentials are the same between uh, even a patient's own footwear. Um, do, do you think, that this is something that we need to talk to patients about more than, than we do. Um, you mean the type of shoes that they're choosing? Yeah, so if, if, they're, if they have an AFO that's been tuned and, mm -hmm. and it's been optimised, um, do, do you think we talk to patients enough about the footwear that they use? Um, I would probably guess not. Um, I think that, I think we've moved away um, largely from uh, prescribing over splint boots for for AFOs um, as a standard, I don't think that that happens quite as often anymore, which is a good thing, um, because in terms of the stability, you get that from the AFO. But often, if you know, footwear over splint footwear is almost designed as a as a stability boot that goes over an AFO. And the problem you've got with that is if you've got a patient who's um, primary pathology is, for instance, knee hyperextension at mid stance, and you put them in a uh, over splint boot with the stiffened sole, which they, they tend to have, then you're going to induce further knee hyperextension. So I, I think we've moved away from that and we have a better understanding of that. I don't know how other clinicians work, but the way that, that we work here is that when we've issued the AFO, we ask the patient to go away and to choose some footwear and then we bring them back for a, a tuning appointment. Once we've tuned that AFO um, footwear combination, um, we explain to the patient that this is a, a, a prescription um, in one, it's your, it's your splint and it's your footwear that they're, they're working together. So if you decide to change your footwear, you'll need to contact us so we can go through the tuning process again and get those adapted. Um, for your needs. So that, that's something that, that we do. Um, I'm not quite sure what, what other services are doing in terms of footwear. Um, I think we've probably got a long way to go on that for it to be anywhere near standardised. That sounds like a really interesting idea though. Um, that, that's, that's great. Um, something else that I wanted to talk to you about, I know that you've done some, some research and um, I know you've written some papers on um, what clinicians uh, across the country, what they do in terms of tuning, uh, when they tune, who they tune, why they tune, all of these kinds of things. Um, and I find that really interesting. Um, I think it kind of probably ties in slightly as well with something you mentioned earlier, which was kind of based around the terminology uh, and how that sort of varies also from, uh, you know, within research and, and certainly from, from talking to different clinicians. Uh, I, I think that's that's something that, that is really, really variable. Um, is I know that's something that I've, I've heard you speak about before. Yeah, I, when we did that study in um, 2014, I think it was. Um, we, it was kind of a, just to get an understanding of what, what's happening um, uh, across the, the UK in terms of orthotists. We only asked orthotists, you know, what, what's happening? Do you understand um, AFO tuning? What does it mean to you? Um, are you utilising it? If so, how? If not, why not? Um, kind of thing. And 50% of respondents said, yes they was they was utilizing it um when we delved a little bit deeper and we kind of asked them how they're utilizing it there there was some misunderstanding there as to to what afo tuning was and and how it works now i think that was probably down to the fact that there was no agreed definition of what afo tuning is um, like I said before, Elaine has brought out the definitions in, in several of her papers and I've mentioned them in my papers. Um, so we, we now have a definition. 
OK, it's not fully agreed and standardised, but it's 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 a definition that's there in the literature that in most researchers are using. Um, the interesting thing was was why people are not tuning. Um, and one of the major things was um, lack of access to 3D gate analysis. That's 34 percent of respondents said that, um, which again was a misconception. The belief that you need uh, 3D uh, gate analysis to to tune AFOs. Uh, and the other thing was um, a lack of time. Now, I think it was 27 percent of, of respondents said they, they don't tune because of a lack of time. Now, our more, our more recent paper that we did in 2018, which looked at the orthotic service provision across the UK, I got some interesting information out of that that kind of backs up what the clinicians were saying in, in 2014. Um, we found that appointment times were between 18 and 41 minutes on average, um, which when we compare it with our AHP peers is, is not a long time at all. And the other thing that we found is that 79% of the respondents, and this was through a freedom of information um, to all the trusts in the UK, 79% um, of, of trusts said that they don't have access to simple video technology. Now, I find that quite amazing. I, I think it's we were so undersold as a, as a profession. You know, we're, we're experts in uh, biomechanical assessment, we're experts in gait analysis. And yet from this study and from you know talking to colleagues and probably from your own experience, Matt, you'll, you'll find that when you go to an orthotic service, um, you know, by and large, the clinic room is probably just about big enough to stretch your arms and get possibly <laughs> one more person in. Sure. So how, how are we expected to utilise our skills of uh, biomechanical assessment and particularly gate analysis when we're not given um, the clinic room and the technology? I mean, basic videos, a basic video camera, 79 percent don't have that. You know, I think I think the NHS it misses out on, on our skills because of that. And I, and I think, unfortunately, patients miss out on our skills because of that. Sure. Um, and uh, I think, yeah, you're right. Certainly the, the clinic spaces I've seen, I mean, I know some people are very lucky. They, they have access to, to, you know, slightly more space. But I think as a general rule, certainly from, from what I've seen and from speaking to other people, uh, space just to watch people walk with or without video technology is, is certainly not something that everybody has ample access to. Um, and then I think when you when you couple that with the, the lack of availability of video technology, it's, it's it makes everything really difficult, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it does. Uh, I, it, it's something that I hope with the um, with the changes that are going on uh, in terms of COVID and, and the NHS is moving um, quite fast in terms of IT, it, it might be something that, that orthotic services are, are able to have access to um, to assess our patients uh, going forward. Let's wait and see. We can only hope, I guess. <laughs> yes. <well. laughs> If we're talking about people then that don't have access to video technology, um, I, I've, I've, I've read some pieces, I, th I think, written by you and by various other people as well about um, about static tuning um, and perhaps, you know, uh, looking at using a, a goniometer and, and things mm -hmm. like that to, to tune. Um, how, how might that work? I think that, that that's the when we talked at the beginning of this podcast and we said about um, just let's get back to basics. If you don't have access to um, video equipment, we can still do something. Mm -hmm. um, so we can still have a look at our patient. We have to be able to have a look at the patient walking. You, you, you can't do it without that. It's impossible. We need to know what's happening when the patient walks. We need to be have an understanding of what's happening at mid stance. So where is the shank at mid stance? What's happening to the knee at mid stance? And what's happening at terminal stance? You know, are we getting the extension um, that we should be getting at terminal stance? When we should be getting maximum knee extension, are we getting it? Mm -hmm. um, so what can we do if we haven't got a video camera? Well, you're right. We can we can have a look at the patient um, by eye, if that's all you've got, and um, have an understanding of those things. And I think the first thing we need to do is is, is aim for 10 degrees. Let's keep it simple. Aim for a shank inclination of 10 degrees using your goniometer, using your um, wedges, 
let you well the way we do it here when we do temporary wedges it's double sided sticky tape on the sole of the shoe we put our wedge on and then we put masking tape around it to make sure it's secure mm -hmm. and we have another look at the patient walking um, and then we might adjust it I mean that's really basic and then at the end of that don't forget to check that there's no leg length discrepancy because obviously if you're if you're only treating um, one side or a hemiplegic patient and there's one AFO. One of the things that's really basic, but you forget to do, is just make sure you've not created a leg length discrepancy. Make sure we're, we're equalising that. For any tuning that we do on one side, we're equalising it on the other where it's needed. Um, and that will make a massive difference. I mean, then you've got, you know, as you get a little bit better at it, you, you can start looking at the, the entry in to mid stands and the exit out. Um, so, you know, what's happening, um, particularly at, at heel strike, you know, what's happening to the knee what's happening at terminal stance and then you might be able to adjust your the the sole um as well as the 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 tuning wedge you can start adjusting it maybe you, you need um a positive flare if you want to in, increase knee flexion or maybe you want to to stiffen the sole if you if you want to decrease knee flexion um or maybe you need a point loading rocker um, if you've got excessive knee flexion throughout gait. So they're the things that you can then move on to. But, you know, you, you can still make a huge difference by doing the basics in clinic with, with minimal technology. And I, and I think that's that's probably one of the, the misconceptions that came out of the 2014 paper that, 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 that clinicians didn't realise that. I think they thought AFO tuning was something that's done um in, in the gate lab and it's not something that can be done in clinic and I, th I think that opinion is changing great so um i guess one of the one of the obvious questions then um if you you know you said earlier um i think it was around 30 percent, 27 percent of people said that um if they didn't tune it was because uh, they didn't have time and i know you mentioned that um well, well two things one the, the, uh, where you work, you have uh, you schedule dedicated appointments for tuning, um, and you also mentioned uh, from from one of the the, the the freedom of information requests that you did, um, the average uh, appointment length was between eighteen and forty one minutes. How long, reasonably, do you need to tune an AFO? It depends. It depends on the patient. It depends how complex they are. Um, it depends if you're tuning just one side or both, and um, patients present differently on both sides when they're diplegic sometimes so it really depends I think you have to have a trust in the service that the clinician can adequately request the time that they require um, I, I think you know BAPO standards for appointment times are there for us to to use um, I don't think they are being used uh, across the board in fact from that a study we know that they're not mm -hmm. um so i think it would be great to have you know national standards so we don't have services that have 10 minute appointments or 20 minute appointments to set, assess an afo you know you 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 can have guidelines i mean our appointments here it's different at the moment because we're in covid so our import our appointments have increased because you've got to you know do the um wiping down the clinics and, and, and so on. So there's infection prevention that we didn't have before. So it's, it's, not, it's not the same picture as before, but, but take COVID out of the picture. We had a minimum of 20 minutes and 40 minutes, and then if required, requested by the, the clinician, 60 minutes. So any assessment for an AFO would be a minimum of 40 minutes. Um, and, you know, if we, could, if we could agree national standards on that would be fantastic, but, it's such a political issue uh, because obviously in, in orthotics we have um, a mix of contracted services and NHS services um, and you know it's not always a contractor that's that's requesting you know reduced appointment times sometimes it's the trust is putting that pressure on the on the contractor and um, for all different kinds of reasons you know through the fallacious belief that it, it, it's going to reduce your waiting time when it's probably going to increase it because patients are going to come back sure uh, you know so these, these all different reasons as as to why um it isn't the same everywhere but i think first and foremost we need more information um i think our study was a start um but it was only it's only scratching the surface we need more information on how services across the uk are running 
I think one of the one of the things that came out of the NHS England um, report was the fact that we don't have a lot of data because we don't have systems that are capable of of um, capturing that data and we're not putting that data in. So how can we look at services, see where they're going wrong, see what we're doing right and improve them if we don't have the data? So I think I think more research needs to be done on, you know, what what do the services look like? Um, why is it that we don't have the data? I mean, NHS England made the point of saying we don't have the data, but but why is that? You know, let's have a look. What what is it that we're doing that is is enabling some trust fantastically and other other trusts appallingly to the point where they can't tell you very much at all? Um, and is there that shifting of responsibility? I mean, when we when we did our FOI study, we got responses back from trust saying uh, we don't know, we don't have that information because um, it's run by a contractor. Well, the legal responsibility for those patients still lies with the trust. They may have contracted that service out for a period of time, three, five years, whatever it may be. But they are still responsible and they still should know what's happening with that service, what what the skill mix of those clinicians are and, you know, the state of that service. You know, how many patients are you seeing? How many complaints do you get? What's your waiting times? Um, and so on and so on. But the fact that they couldn't tell us that in, in you know, quite a lot of uh, trust that was was worrying. Sure. And I guess just from just from a kind of the bigger picture point of view, it's kind of hard to. To, uh, to to lobby for things to to change if if that data is not available if if you can't make a point with the data because it's it's not accessible then I guess that's that makes things a lot more difficult too. Absolutely, I mean we have to start from a basis of understanding where we're at, and if we don't have that data, it's very difficult to do that. Sure. Um, something else, I guess, something else that I wanted to talk to you about. Um, I know um, probably because I'm a student and I've been encouraging my friends to, to listen to these podcasts and things. Uh, so I know there are a couple of students that listen. Um, I wanted to talk to you, if I could, just a little bit about AFOs in general. Um, so two two things in particular, really. So you mentioned earlier about the ankle angle in the AFO. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you talked about like the, the length of gastrocnemius. Um, I just wondered if you, you know, certainly this... Um, I think perhaps really a lot, the best way to put it is there are a lot of misconce- misconceptions um, or just different ideas perhaps about the best um, or most appropriate, however you, you'd like to call it, the, the, the best ank- ankle angle in an AFO. Um, mm-hmm. I know a lot of people say 90 degrees as, as standard and things, but mm-hmm. um, you, know, you mentioned earlier about the importance of uh, assessing a patient and, and deciding on things like the appropriate angle um, mm-hmm. in the in uh, in the different planes how what what happens if you you know say for example you're casting a patient um and in order to get the the ankle to 90 degrees that you you know you're flexing the knee for example the only way you can get that angle to 90 degrees is by flexing the knee uh, the second you extend the knee um you know you, you say you're slightly plantar flexed what effect would that have if you make someone an afo what effect would that have on their gait well i think roy bowers summed it up the best by his term what he uses stealing uh gastroc from the, the knee and that's what mm-hmm. you're doing so if you if you assess gastroc length with the knee flexed well the the, the main thing you've got to understand there is you, you're not walking with your knee flexed so if you're gonna do an afo to the angle with the knee flexed, expect them to flex their knee when they walk um because that's how you've created an afo you haven't accommodated the gastro um so that that's what you're going to get you're going to either get the patient walking on their toes or you're going to get them flexing their knee because Mm -hmm. it it, it crosses two joints so if you if you want them to walk in a okay normal way don't like using that word but you know standard way then you you have to make sure that the length of gastroc is accommodated so they can get knee extension um, and they can get heel strike. Um, if you do it with the knee flex, then you're going to be stealing that length and you're going to see one of those two deviations when you put the AFO on the patient. And I think I think uh, I mentioned it in my um, presentation, uh, staff's clinical biomechanics conference, um, that that's one of the things that that was kind of the reason why I started research was because uh, as a graduate, 
what the referrals always asked for AFOs at 90 degrees and it was you know the holy grail the AFO must be at 90 degrees at all costs and you know I think it was um, I think it was of the understanding of, of, of the team that, that that's the best thing for the patient obviously but I think the, the misunderstanding came from the fact that they believed that at mid stance your ankle is at 90 degrees and your knee is extended okay. and we know that that isn't true um, and that is why I couldn't quite understand it as, as a new graduate, but that was why all the patients that we were giving these splints to walked in on their toes and walked out on their toes. Um, we'd not accommodated gastroc. So um, it's really important. It's a really important point. And I think I think there's much more understanding out there now, although we still got work to do about you know, forget the 90 degrees. And the 90 degrees is still a deficit. You know, if you've got a, a foot ankle complex that gets to 90 degrees with, not, with knee extended, you still have a gastroc deficit. You're still not going to be able to achieve your 10 to, to uh, 12 degrees inclination at mid stance. I think people think, um, and I've seen it myself with colleagues, that if they do the assessment and they've got 90, great, the patient's got 90. Well, yeah, great, because they haven't got a 10 degree plantar flexion contracture, but they still have a deficit. And I think we, we've got to understand that. And I think, I think we, you know, there is more understanding of that now. Sure. And, and I guess the, the, if, if we're talking about someone then being forced to walk um, with their, their knees slightly flexed um, throughout, particularly in, in, in certain, in certain patient groups with, with certain pathologies, we know that actually that can, that can make things a lot worse. That can sort of increase the, the chances of developing contractures and things like that. Absolutely. I mean, I think, um, Again, another interesting um, thing that Elaine Owen has, has talked quite a lot about um, in her work is the big V, um, the, you know, the extension of, of the muscles of the lower limb at terminal stance. And when we get this big V and when we're aiming for this big stretch, well, if we haven't accommodated gastro, we're not going to get that. So whilst if you do get that, every step is almost like physiotherapy session because mm -hmm. you're stretching those muscles and that doesn't matter if the AFO is in 10 degrees plantar flexion if it's properly accommodated and there's been a shank angle to bench of 90 degrees and then you've tuned it then you you know there's some patients you can't do that with because they have you know like I explained before contracted at the knee and you, you don't get that knee extension we can still improve but we don't get it but there are still plenty of people where we can in a, in a 10 degrees, you know, plantar flex AFO. Um, so you're right that if if we do um, fail to accommodate gastroc, then with each step, we, we're not getting a stretch. And further down the line, we get further contracture. And it's unfortunately, it's a vicious cycle. Great. Thanks a lot. Uh, just to, I guess, just to kind of wrap up, just to circle background um, to AFO tuning. Uh, I, have, I have two final questions for you. Um, so I guess one of them would be um, if, you know, if, if people are saying that, you know, tuning is something they, they think they should do more of and, and um, at the moment currently not able to do, what do you think needs to, needs to change in terms of, um, I guess, practice? What, what needs to change in order to facilitate that? Um, the other question um, I'll come to afterwards, but, but yeah, first of all, what, what do you think needs to change in terms of clinical practice? I think we need uh, appropriate appointment times. You know, the ideal, the gold standard would be national standards. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you need an appropriate skill mix in um, in any clinic setup. Um, you know, we've heard of stories of of new graduates going into clinics and they're more senior there. Um, I'm not quite sure how you can ask somebody to develop in those circumstances. But you need to be able to ask your, your seniors for advice. Um, I think you need to have a setup where you can reappoint the patient. I mean, realistically, if you're, it's very rare in my experience that you fit an AFO and a patient has a pair of shoes that, that fit over it great. You know, usually they have to go away and find footwear. Um, so, I mean, if you do have those patients, then OK, double book your appointment to, to do the tuning. But by and large, you, you really need to call them back for a tuning session. So to have that built into your clinic, to be able to do that. What we what we talked about before the appropriate clinic space so we can observe the patient's gait. I mean, it's, it's just a basic. It really is basic. 
um, access to basic technology. I mean, we're lucky that, uh, well, I'm lucky that I've got access to a fantastic lab at Staffs Uni. Um, but you know you don't you don't need that you you, uh, you know a standard video camera on a tripod where you can freeze frame it and you know look back so you're clear what's happening at temporal mid stance to understand what temporal mid stance is so so you know what you're looking at um i think that's that's really important um you know, just to have a basic image in your mind of what, what you're looking for when you look at that patient so um so for instance when i'm looking at a patient and we have to look, the whole of the gate is important but i need to understand the segments of gate and to do that i'm very clear at what, what temporal mid stance looks like and it is it's quite simple it's the you have the standing limb um when that's flat on the floor the swing limb you'll have the knee slightly anterior to the standing limb and you'll have the heel slightly posterior to the standing limb and the head and the trunk will be over the foot and, and that's temporal mid stance that that's what we're looking at what is happening there what is happening at that point in the gait cycle i had really difficult to do uh, by eye alone so just have a basic video camera to just freeze frame you know slowly go back and go right there it is there's temporal mid stance what's happening um and also you know to further on right there's terminal stance you know what's happening there are we getting a stretch you know, are we getting a, an early heel lift? What, what's happening? It's just basic, basic technology. It's not a lot to ask for a video camera and some space. Um, and I, another important thing, if we're going to do um, like we do here, which is the calling the patient back um, for AFO tuning, is to have agreed lead times from the manufacturers. It's another thing that the industry doesn't have. I mean, we do have fantastic lead times at our service, and I know a lot of other services do, but there's also some services that don't. So if you've got a long waiting list, I mean, have a look, have a think about how that looks in practice. So if you've got a waiting list, like the ones that were shown in um, in, in our recent study, which vary hugely. So let's just say you had an eight week waiting list. So you get the patient in and you're either assessing or you're reviewing a, a, an existing AFO and they've waited eight weeks and then you need to send you take your cast and you need to send that cast off to your manufacturer um, now if they've got long waiting times let's say it takes them three weeks to get that back to you now you've got to reappoint the patient so that's a further possibly eight weeks and the patient comes in and has it fitted now you're sending them away to get footwear and then you've got to appoint them for a a tuning session. I mean, how sure. much time has gone from the first time you assessed them to actually giving them a tuned AFO? And if uh, this and is a child, the chances are they've outgrown it. Absolutely. I was just going to ask you is if that's a child, is that still going to fit? <laughs> that, that, that's why we need um, we need those those things to all fall into place. And some of them are outside of our control. We know there's a, a shortage of orthotists. You know, there's been talk about um, 3D printing. Can we get these? these AFOs faster. Well, in my experience, getting the AFOs, the AFOs faster has never been an issue. The issue is, is your waiting times. So it doesn't matter how quickly we can get the AFOs if we have a waiting list of eight to 10 weeks or more. Uh, and that's usually down to staff shortages. And that's, you know, outside the control of, of the clinician. Um, and sometimes outside the, the control of the service manager. So, you know, there, there are a lot of other things that play into it. It's not, it's not always as simple as just saying we need these things. You know, we, we have a shortage of orthotists and that needs to be addressed as well. Absolutely. Um, something I know um, from reading some of your work, uh, I know you looked at um, so approximating the the shank vertical angle with the uh, the angle at temporal temporal mid stance. Um, so it's probably worth mentioning, um, you know, the, the findings of that. So uh, do you want to talk to us a little bit about that? Um, are you referring to the SVA paper where we looked at the, the static measurement? That's the one. Yeah. Yeah. So what we want you to do really is um, is is kind of uh, look at uh, Elaine Elaine Owens' uh, work because he's based on Elaine's work. You've got to mm -hmm. give credit to Elaine, um, who, who who and Roy Bowers and Barry Meadows, who've done a lot of work off, on AFO tuning. 
Um, and it was based on the premise that if we stand the patient um, and we, we get a goniome return, it's relaxed stance and we're measuring um, the SVA and we put our, our um, tuning wedges on and we ask them to walk, we assumed that that measurement would be the same or similar, not exactly the same, but, you know, there or thereabouts, mm -hmm. as the measurement in uh, dynamic gait at mid stance. But we never actually had any research to back that up. So that's why we did that study. And um, yeah, it agreed with what Elaine said and it found that it did um, correlate very closely with the angle uh, of the SVA uh, at temporal mid stance. So it, it, yeah, it was it was uh, it was just more to add to the literature that um, on AFO tuning and, and and kind of how it works both statically and dynamically. And so that that finding then is is uh, I think particularly interesting for someone who you know like you mentioned a lot of people don't have access to the technology video technology things and, and space in clinic but it means that you you certainly can do some sort of tuning um, that's likely to you know to, to make a difference to your patients even without all of that um, even in the absence of all of that sort of equipment. Absolutely, I think that's one of the things we alluded to in the paper. We wanted to, we wanted to give it again that ecological validity of a clinic setting where you don't have um, 3D gate analysis and you, you, you're not able to have a force plate with a ground reaction force line on it, and uh, you know a vector showing you where uh, what's happening. And um, we wanted to to keep it as simple as possible and and, and see how well using those um, basic methods it correlated with the SVA and mid stance and you know the results were were really positive and um, yeah I was happy with that paper. Great, um, Nikki, I've really enjoyed speaking to you. I've got one final question for you, which I, I suppose is a little bit loaded, really. Um, I feel like I know the answer already. Um, <laughs> in your mind, is AFO tuning a kind of an optional extra or is it something that we should be looking to do um, with, you know, pretty much any time we've, we've got an AFO? Um, it's definitely not an optional extra. Um, it, it, it should be. It should be as standard, it, like with prosthetics. Um, Again, something I mentioned in my um, presentation at staffs, you, know, that you, you wouldn't get a, a prosthetist issuing a prosthesis to a patient. Does that fit well? Yes, it does. OK, thank you. Goodbye. You know, it just wouldn't happen. You'd watch the patient walk and you would make fine adjustments. And that's what it is. It's fine adjustments for that patient. There's not a one fit, fits all AFL and there's not a one fits all prosthesis. Um, so I think I think we look at the the term tuning and we've kind of looked at it as a you know biomechanical term and um, as quite a technical term but actually what tuning means is is, is making something optimized you know whether you tune a piano whether you tune a prosthesis it's it's making it better it's making it, it's optimizing it for that purpose so i don't think we could ever say it's optional to optimize something for a patient um, when you think of it in those terms, we we should be doing it as standard. Absolutely, it, it's hard to disagree with you, Nikki. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you so much for talking to me today. Um, it's it's been it's been really interesting for me. I hope it's been interesting for people that are listening. I'm I'm sure that it has. Yeah, and it's great talking to you. And thanks for inviting me on. Do Absolutely. it again sometime. <laughs> great. Thanks very much. No problem, Matt. See you soon.